relationship with the Father we could ever experience on earth. Wow. And what good father does not want to give good things to his children? If that's my destination, don't I have an obligation to abide by the rules? Hmm. God's not just a, hey, someone up here, don't break my rules. They're set up to bring us life. Life here on this earth and abundant life from here after. What if you would have got past, because I got past a couple times. I, they had to be doing 90 to 100. They had to be, because they just blew by me. I didn't even know they were in the lane beside of me. I didn't see them before, and then they blew by me. What if that had been you sitting there, and that was your pastor with his little green hat going by you? You'd have said, wait a minute. Pastor ain't supposed to do that. He's got a standard to uphold. We all have a standard to uphold. We have an obligation to God our Father for what He's done through Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ said, if anyone come after me. He said later, if anyone come after me, and he does not deny himself, if he does not give up everything, if he looks back once he places the hand on the plow, he's not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Because our hearts have got to be sold out to God because of the love that He gave us. John says we can't know love without God because He first loved us. And then He calls us to love. John, this guy that wanted to rain down fire from heaven on these disobedient people, now says, oh, wait a minute. It's all because of love. So if you did your extra credit, then you read 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 instead of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, starts out this way. Concerning this salvation. Ah, this is before Peter wrote 2 Peter, right? 1 Peter comes before 2 Peter. He's still talking about the same thing. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently with great care. All these prophets from the Old Testament that we're reading about trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah because Christ was obedient even to death of the cross. And, oh, we got a second thing here, the glories that would follow, which Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I am, there you will be also. We will receive those future glories if we put our trust and obedience in Jesus Christ. Verse 12, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, because of this, with minds that are alert and fully sober, this repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I need to change my thought process so that, so that I can change my heart and change my life. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope, that confidence you have even though you can't see these things, on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. This next time, this next time that Jesus comes back to separate the sheep and the goats, to bring His reward and His judgment, depending on where you're at, and then we will be forevermore with the Lord. Verse 14, As obedient children. Hmm. As obedient children. Yep, I expect my child to obey. It's because I do love him. It's because I do want him safe. And it does make me mad, doesn't it, Jacob, when he did not disobey. I mean, when he did not obey. Sorry, let me get that right. He wanted to beat me. <laughs> because I wanted the best for him. I wasn't just this rule guy. I wanted the best for my child. Nothing has changed except for the fact now that he has to, from what he was trained, make the decisions himself in his own heart, in his own mind. So it's so important that we train up our children in the ways of the Lord. 
As obedient children, what are we supposed to do? Do not conform to the evil desires that you had while you lived in ignorance. Oh, I'm not supposed to speed now. Okay, remember that one. Hold on. Okay. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Do you remember that? We read that in Leviticus. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, impartially, then live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear of God. Hmm. I hope some of this that you're reading in the Old Testament is making a little more sense. So now I want to ask you a question. I keep asking and I'll keep asking and I'll keep asking. If you read Peter, Peter will say, I keep coming to you for the same things. Why would I not? That's my calling is to keep on telling you, to remind you. Oh, kind of like when we write it on the doorpost and get, when we get up and talk about it, when we go sit down, we talk about it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to keep reminding you of what we believe. So the first question is, do you believe? Do you have saving belief? Is heaven your destination? Because remember, Jesus is talking to people who think they believe think that they have saving belief, but their destination is not heaven. He calls them hypocrites because they're just acting. They're play acting on a stage for the world to see, but God knows their heart. And they even try to justify and say, oh, there's many of them on that day. Say, Lord, Lord, why are you telling us we can't come to our destination? Didn't we do many mighty miracles in your name? Didn't we even cast out demons? But God says, depart from me, I do not know you. <laughs> there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they thought they knew what their destination was, but they didn't. So if the weatherman asks you, or the weatherman says, there's a 100% chance of rain tomorrow, do you believe him? He's a weatherman. He went to meteorology school. I'll get it out. I'm having tongue tied today. He's got all these tools and everything. Chances when you see that precipitation going up from 40 to 50 to 60, then you take the heed more. 100%? Well, it can't be 100%, but I've seen it plenty of times. <laughs> I don't know how you can predict a 100% chance of rain unless it's raining. <laughs> but they're predicting for tomorrow. Do you believe him? What if your doctor says if you don't change your lifestyle, you are going to die? Do you believe him? What if your father says if you don't obey me, you're going to die? Do you believe him? Well, wait a minute. Your father wouldn't say if you don't obey him, you're going to die. Put something else in there. Okay, I will. <laughs> If your father says to you, if you don't take the trash out, you're going to get a whooping. <laughs> Jacob, did you get whoopings? Yep. 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 For the trash. I don't know, but he got whoopings. He got whoopings. <laughs> I lived on that verse, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's not actually what it says, but that's okay. Do you believe that the, each of those instances? I tell you how you believe. You know how you believe. You know it right now because it went through your mind. The way you reacted, if you were obedient or not. Your actions. Spoiler alert, we're reading the Bible through in chronological order, right? After we get through reading the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus, what's the next letter written? Guys, don't say anything. <laughs> James, because these so-called believers who say they're following the way aren't acting because they're not living and they're not doing. So James has to pen the words and says, show me your faith without your works. You can't. Your faith is not genuine. Mm. You'll get to that when we get to the New Testament. I think that's around October, but I'm not sure. But clearly, your response, your obedience, tells whether you believed what was said or not. 
Now, if that is true here and we're made in the image of God and we hear his words over and over again, what do you think that he demands? A perfect, true, righteous, holy God. He demands total obedience, which the law tells us. And we can't do that. <laughs> but praise be to Jesus Christ that he did. And we just have to believe and put our faith and trust in Him and now obey His commands, showing that we have true saving belief. And we get an eternity in heaven. We will reach our destination. Wow. Praise be to God for what Jesus Christ has done, that He obeyed God and humbled Himself to the death of a cross. If you read in your little ultimate Bible guide, which there's one more here for someone that doesn't have it, you would see that in Deuteronomy, because that's where we're now, that the key text was Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. <laughs> this morning on my phone, let's see if I have it. I was not surprised, but surprised to see the verse of the day, Deuteronomy 6, 5. <laughs> and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. What a coincidence. Key text, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. 4 starts out this way. Listen, Israel, because their parents hadn't, had not listened already. They had seen the mighty works of God, the parting of the sea, the enemies of God destroyed, the plagues, everything else. They had heard God speak to them from the fire and flame out of the darkness into the light. And yet they still grumbled complained, and disobeyed. So they didn't reach the promised land. Only two did. You remember that? Joshua and Caleb. Caleb, the one who loved God wholeheartedly with all of his heart. Yeah, he made it. And God's promise was delivered to their children. Not because of the obedience of the parents, but because God is a loving, faithful God. And he made that promise. So Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Listen, Israel, because it's a retelling that Moses is about to die and he's retelling this account to these children so that they will not sin, but instead be obedient. The key term that the book says is commandments. And what we're supposed to do with commandments? Oh, listen and obey them, right? Going back to the New Testament a minute. Testament a minute. I told you I was tongue-tied because I want to tie this together. John, that apostle of love, wrote this in 1 John 4, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not, love, does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, what does He acknowledge? Jesus is the Son of God. Remember that because I'm going to tie it together with something else in a minute. Then God lives in them and they in God. So what does that acknowledgement mean? Verse 16, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us. Now, that's not contradictory. Let me explain the fear here because you've got to understand the words. I fear my Father because He is my Father. Not just because He might give me whoopings, but because He's my authority. 
I still have reverent fear for my father. I love him more today than I did back then because I have more understanding for his love for me. I don't fear his punishment, but I still have fear for him because I reverently love him. Because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to fear death anymore. We don't have to fear punishment. God loves us. And what we've read so far shows that love and how faithful He is. How He built an ark to save one man and His children. <laughs> Don't forget that part in there. When you are faithfully serving Him, that you're training up your children. And that man represented Jesus Christ. Noah wasn't the righteous one that saved people. Moses wasn't the righteous one who gave them the law. He didn't even enter in the promised land. But Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God, the Messiah, the Christ, who died for our sins. But we are taught to be obedient. We are taught to train up our children. And remember before I said, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, what does that mean? Well, let me give you another verse that will help. And all these are found around in the 10th verse. That is ironic that they're all found right in there. Brothers and sisters, this is Romans 10, verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they be, may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. Oh, yes. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they do not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. We don't have to obey this law or that law. We can change this around to fit our needs. Verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ, though, is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. Quoting Leviticus again. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouths and on your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. That message from Deuteronomy. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So the Son of Man, the Son of God, is God Himself who was willing to give up his deity to become flesh and blood, to live and die while he committed no sin. He was totally obedient to the law that he established so that he could reestablish you with a right relationship with God. And you need to proclaim that he is Lord. Not Savior, but Lord of your life. He is your all because he gave his all. You give up your life in obedience because He gave up His life to save you. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Compare that to 1 John 4, 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So now let's look at Deuteronomy a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 3, Moses pleads to God. He says, let me please enter the promised land. Let me lead these people. I've led them this far. I've prayed and interceded for them time and time again so that you would not destroy them. But God says, nope, you're not going. Wait a minute, Moses said before he changed God's mind. So you have to take that for what it means. Through prayerful consideration, it looks like God changed his mind to us because he wants to work through his prayerful people. But he knew all the time what he was going to do. And he appoints a new leader, Joshua. Okay, And there's a lot of things there about Joshua, but we'll talk about that probably next week. But he pleads and God says, nope, you're not entering. says he even became angry. And then he let Moses know that he was going to die without entering the promised land. And Joshua would be the one that would lead his people into the promised land. i got a video we're going to play in just a second that will explain a little bit more. 
Moses was not the Savior of his people. Joshua was not the Savior of his people. But Yeshua, which was promised, will be, which real similar to Joshua, isn't it? More than real similar. We'll get into that later. So that we could enter into that Sabbath rest that we're supposed to remember and keep holy. Because we'll enter into a Sabbath rest for all of eternity. Maybe this video will help explain a little bit. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. That's from the Bible. That's from the Bible Project. So you can see they have more videos than what you've just seen. So there's a good training tool for you and your family. Um, the videos that I've showed so far, they have a previous video of them also. So there's two to every introduction of the Bible. There's a lot of other topics and things. Check them out. Now, I hope that brought some insight. I'm going to use Jacob as an example again. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. I don't need to say obey, do I? It's implied. We know that. Listen. Take out the garbage. It's implied he's supposed to obey that. And it's also implied that there are probably consequences if he doesn't. Doesn't it make sense from our Heavenly Father the same thing? Listen and obey are the same things. The noun is Shema. The verb is Shemar. 1,159 times Shema is used in the Old Testament. 468 times Shemar is used. You think it's important? Listen and do it. They're the same thing. 
So as we're reading Deuteronomy, starting in chapter 4, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation here just simply because that's what I'm reading. And now Israel, listen carefully, Shema, to these decrees and regulations that I am about to teach you. Shamar, because see it's a verb. Obey them. Why? So that you may live. So that you may enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add or subtract from these commands that I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. You saw for yourself what the Lord did at Baal Peor. There the Lord your God destroyed everyone who had worshipped Baal, the God of Peor. But all of you who were faithful to the Lord your God are still alive today, every one of you. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations just as the Lord God commanded me, so that you may obey them in the land you are about to enter. Obey them completely, and you will display your wisdom and intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they, they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, How wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. What's changed for the church? What happens when they look at you and say you're a Christian? Do they see Christ in you? Or do they see hypocrisy and disobedience? How much more should we live as obedient children of God, the fact that we know that everything that the prophets foretold of came true, that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. How much more is God, our Heavenly Father, going to want us to be living a life of obedience for Him? Hmm. And it's so that these other people can see and then make up their mind that our lights can shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father that's in heaven, not us. And how they're going to see that is by our love. Even when we love our enemies, they go, how do you do that? The movie Friday night certainly told that. Wow. Verse 7, For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on Him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as the body of instructions that I am giving you today? But watch out. Be careful never to forget. If you were looking in the original text there, it said, Shamar, Shamar, Shamar. Ha, ah, we don't know that till we look at that. Three times it's repeated so that we listen carefully so that we are obedient, so that we do train up our children so that they never, ever forget. I'm going to skip down to verse 24. The Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. I'm skipping down to verse 32. Now search all of history from the time God created the people on the earth until now. And we've got a lot more of God's history, don't we? <laughs> and we don't have to go to a high priest and offer these sacrifices. We have God living inside of us. We are priests. Wow. So I'm skipping down to verse 39, Kim. So remember this and keep it firmly in mind. The Lord is God both in heaven and earth, and there is no other. If you obey all the decrees and commands I am giving you today, all will be well with you and your children. I am giving you these instructions so you will enjoy a long life in the land of the Lord your God, the Lord your God is giving you. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have a retelling of the Ten Commandments. Now, do you see why we have a retelling there? Okay. This new generation, Moses is telling them again, here is the Ten Commandments. And then he's going to expound on these Ten Commandments by saying, suppose and if, and, and let's apply these, so that you don't say, hmm, later on. You've got these examples now. And in verse 24 of Deuteronomy 5, they said, look, the Lord our God has shown us His glory and greatness. I haven't seen Christ yet. And we have heard His voice. Hearing automatically means obedience. We have heard His voice from the heart of the fire. Today we have seen that God can speak to humans. They had no idea that the Holy Spirit would come as tongues of fire and live inside of us and empower us and seal us. They had no idea of this. Wow. Where we have the privilege to serve God with what He's equipped us with. 
And yet we live, they said. How can this happen? Verse 25, but now why would we risk death again? Why would we not be obedient? But you know what happens. If the Lord our God speaks to us again, we will certainly die and be consumed by this awesome fire. Verse 26, can anyone living, any, any living thing hear the voice of the living God from the heart of the fire as we did and yet survive? Go yourselves and listen to what the Lord our God says. Then come and tell us everything He tells you, and we will listen and obey. The Lord heard the request you made to me, and He said, I have heard what the people said to you, and they are right. Oh, that they should all, would always have hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commands. If they did, they and their descendants would prosper forever. Go and tell them, return to your tents, but you stand here with me so I can give you all my commands, decrees, and regulations. You must teach them to the people so that they can obey them in the land I am giving them as their possession. So Moses told the people, you must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God. Follow his, his instructions in every detail. Verse 33, stay on the path. <laughs> Does that remind you of something? The way, the truth, and the life. Stay on the path. Not the path to Kennewick, but the path to heaven. Stay on the path that the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosper. Did you see that as my title? Yeah, yep, some of you are probably thinking Star Trek, right? <laughs> Fooled you. Maybe next week. <laughs> then you will live long and prosper, prosperous lives in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Remind you again, Jesus never called anyone a Christian. He called them brothers. He called them disciples. He called them friends. And they were called those who followed the way, the path of righteousness that they saw in flesh and blood living among them and dying for them. Later, they became called Christians because they were acting like Christ. Nothing's changed. That's what we're called to live and breathe today, to be a light to the world. So then you get to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if you were reading the NL, NLT, you would see a nice little header there that says, A call for wholehearted commitment. Yep. And these are the words you would read in chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. These are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God has commanded me to teach to you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all His decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey then all will go well with you and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, and you, the, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Neat thing there, too, if you understand Back in those days, people thought because their actions were based on their heart that this was the thinking center, not this. Okay? And that's your strength. Verse 6, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road. When you're going to bed and when you're getting up, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I could give you sermon after sermon after sermon and spend right here. This should be key to your belief in God that this is what He wants from you to raise up your children so they see the genuineness of your belief rather than your hypocrisy. In fact, I had to stop here and divide it into two sermons. Could have had ten. But remember this. You know what this prayer is called? The Hebrews still say it today. It's called the Shamar. Hmm. This prayer that they will have this peace 
shalom. This peace that surpasses all understanding. They teach this to their children so that they will fear the Lord and then learn through Christ that perfect love casts out all fear and condemnation because God is their heavenly Father. Wow. Do you believe this? Is your destination heaven? Then are you hearing the Word of God? Because the first thing in hearing it is reading it. That's why I'm trying to spur you on and give you every means to help you understand it and to make it exciting for you. I got a huge compliment yesterday, and I didn't prepare anything, and I'm not tooting my horn, but one of the guys said, you know, those words you said just came alive and inspired me. I've heard them before, but you inspired me. I'm like, yes, <laughs> thank you. That's what I want to do. That's how, what we're supposed to do for each other. That's why I need you. I need a spleen. I need a leg. You need an arm, whatever it is. And we make up the whole body of Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. So the first thing you need to do is read your Bible. <laughs> if you hear it, you're supposed to obey it, right? And then you're supposed to teach it to your children so they do the same. Kind of sounds like the Great Commission, doesn't it? Disciples making disciples. Hmm. So what are you teaching your children? And I'm very, very serious. Are you teaching them what you believe that leads to eternal life? Or are you teaching them what you say you believe that leads to eternal death? Don't have time for the Joshua video. I said that would probably be too long. If you have a computer, read Joshua before you get to it because you're going to make it into it Wednesday, Thursday, I don't know which day. You do have a little map to help you through it. And reach out to a friend or neighbor and say, Are you reading? What did you think about this? They might have just been waiting on that phone call for you to spur them. Okay? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, sealing you declaring you righteous before God if indeed He lives inside of you so that you can have complete confidence on that day. Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You for Your words. Lord, we thank You for the blessing that You gave us of marriage, the ability to reproduce, the blessing of children. Lord, help us to take seriously the life that You have given us and the rebirth that you have given us through the Spirit for the one life we have to live for your glory and for your honor, not for our own. Help us to take seriously your commands and apply them to our lives and to teach them to our children. And we hold firmly to your faithfulness. We are so secure of the hope that we have and the faithfulness that you have for your children because you sacrificed your Son to save us. We thank you for the obedience of Jesus Christ even to the death of the cross to save us. We just pray in His precious name. Amen.